Hello everyone. It's a beautiful day in Mozzata, Italy. And I would like to give a talk as I normally do. <laughs> All right, so I want to speak about a subtler need for understanding through communication. You see, I got a very profound cognition last night. And, you know, I don't normally get, how can I tell you, like, I got something close to some kind of panic attack, but it wasn't a panic like it wasn't an attack, it was just I was looking at something so deeply that I didn't see any purpose in and when I didn't see any purpose in it it kind of shocked me and then I realized something profound afterwards and then the pan sense of panic was gone you see I was looking at a fence <laughs> so I, I went into a sense of panic by looking at a fence in front of my hotel. <laughs> so I want to kind of explain <laughs> what I experienced there, okay? <laughs> you know, it, it was by just looking at that fence, I went into like some kind of existential shock. <laughs> I'm not making this up, that's why it's so funny. To me. <laughs> All right, I gotta get a coffee now. Hold on. All right. <clears throat> to continue. <laughs> so, guys, I, I just got a, as the Italians would say, a cappuccino. Cappuccino. You know? <laughs> An Italian person probably is like. Show me a thumbs up, you know, <laughs> with my accent. You know? <laughs> Cappuccino. Anyways, so I want to continue with this um, panic attack kind of thing I got by looking at a fence. <laughs> so here's the idea, guys. I was looking at a fence, and then I wondered why, the question why. And I was like, why does this exist? And then I kind of came into this view and this perception that the purpose of many things I see around myself is originating within me rather than having its own purpose. One can say the fence is there to protect this and that and that, but just by being a fence, there was kind of like the fence had no meaning aside for just being what it is. So the meaning seems to come from a more dynamic interpretation of uh, a perceiver of the fence. So pretty much I wondered about my own existence and there's been times where uh, I felt I couldn't live for myself so I lived for others. And there's been times where I've tried to live for myself and I've come to empty conclusions. <laughs> but pretty much I suddenly got this realization. I was just, uh, afterwards I went and I was just lying in my bed. I got a habit. Sometimes I sit in kind of meditative poses and just sit down for a while. But sometimes I just go lie in my bed and I turn off all the lights and I just, just lie there, you know? Like that song, what if I just lie here? <laughs> I suddenly realized something profound. I wondered, like with the depth of my mind, I kind of wondered if the cells in my hand were to wonder about the purpose of their existence and would try using just from the reali cellular reality, let's say if they had an ability like human beings to somehow contemplate their existence, you know? This is of course very hypothetical. You know, we, we are to some degree considering ourselves not to be as intelligent as all the cells that make us who we are. 
So I was wondering if a few individual cells in the body suddenly started making theories, started using some kind of mathematics and just computation and science and language they created to kind of comprehend the whole body, I kind of realized they would always fall short. So kind of I came into this conclusion that even though I'm using words right now, even though we have many branches of knowledge, we can never understand what is beyond us with the knowledge and technology we have, the branches of science and all that. It will always fall short because it is uh, our sciences, our language is a design uh, in, within a very tiny part of the universe. And the rest is vast. So it's as if like a cell in the body wanting to understand the purpose of a person going to work, you know? It is, it, its magnitude and intensity is much greater. Therefore, there came this idea that we can understand smaller realities which we identify, but greater realities beyond our identities cannot be understood. But the cell is being part of the body even though it cannot see, for example, outside of the body and all that like a person does. <clears throat> so pretty much, there is a difference between the microcosm and the macrocosm in regards to their identifications and activities. But in regards to how they are being, there is a simultaneousness. The cell is being in the body, doing what it's designed for, same way as a person's like living and whatnot. Anyways, consciousness is a very interesting phenomenon because it seems to be right there uh, experiencing a sense of individual doership, either experiencing a microcosmic or macrocosmic reality, and then there's a sense of beingness. And then there's a sense of beingness. where consciousness seems to be all there is, regardless of its association and identification. A wise man once said, what if every person is the same attention, just existing in others, in other senses of uh, uh, being? So we have to wonder very deeply <clears throat> of the nature of reality, and how if there really is, uh, a difference in the conscious awareness to existence through different life forms. You know, when I look at the word life, it seems to be the same life, but in different forms. My conclusion was that as an individual, I'm existing in a reality where after a certain limit, I cannot know. A person named uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein he says, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. It's a very interesting kind of uh, sentence. Because one can also say, the limits of my experience are the limits of my world. And if you have an experience beyond language, therefore you have transcended language in some sense. I've been occupied by meditation and many different practices, spiritual practices, from meditation to zikr to... Uh, just sitting down and wonder, uh, trying to regress back to the source of my intelligence. And I have understood that reality is a game we play with ourselves in our own minds. That means sometimes you could think something is real, but it doesn't exist out there. So it is in some sense a game. When we ask why do we exist, we are left in a position where, due to the limitations of our free will, we are left to a choice, and existentially we are just a present moment. I want you to really wonder deeply right now if everything you have experienced so far 
has come across to you as a present moment or not. Right now, me giving this talk, I've given many other talks, but they all feel as if I am in one moment, I'm present, and I'm communicating. The time shifts. The intelligence of the time, the intelligence of the space, the intelligence of the experience of existence, it all shifts, but the awareness to it, in some sense, has changed us. I have had dreams, and some people don't acknowledge dreams as being real. But I've moved in these dreams. I've literally been in the dream and I'm like, oh man, I can move. So I've started moving around. And then I've woke up and I realized I've been in my bed the whole time. So it's as if the mind simulated a game of reality for itself, which then there was a player to experience. But then it woke up and again there was a reality. So it's, a dream can be said to be a world in a world. You know, Inception fans, movie fans may agree. <laughs> There's this dervish story I want to share with you. It, it has a very interesting moral. <clears throat> there's this man, he hears there's this wise man, this dervish, Sufi, mystic, saint or something. And then uh, he, back in the day, you know, his caravan, you know, goes by the town of this person. So he's like, I'm going to take a visit. I'm going to give this guy a visit. He knocks on the door, he goes in and the dervish welcomes him in. He sits down and he just looks at the house of this guy and he sees all there is, there's a mat, there's a lamp, and then there's a teapot. So as they're drinking tea, <coughs> the guy, you know, he's kind of like giggling in himself and he's like, hey man, where's your furniture? You know, <laughs> he's like, you know, where's your furniture, you know? The dervish uh, saint, with such intensity, he's like, where's your furniture? <laughs> and then the guy kind of gets a bit, you know, uh, you know, a bit surprised, and he says, what do you mean, where's my furniture? I'm a traveler here, I'm traveling. And then the Sufi sage looks at him, and he's like, so am I. And then the guy gets the point that what this guy means, he's a traveler, is that he, he feels he's a traveler in existence. He's traveling through existence, and this is why he doesn't need so many things, you know? For example, uh, based on that man's way of approach, the sages' way of approach. So, pretty much what I want to say is that there have been human beings who they have wondered about reality and they have, to some degree, concluded that it is a journey uh, through form. And that is the profoundness of an ability of a spiritual perspective. You see, science has its limitations uh, right where it uh, originated its principles and its axioms. Uh, spirituality is more of, rather than a known cause, trying to, trying to know the cause to know the effect, it's, it's kind of like the person realizing that consciousness is unknown to the effect that is known. So the effect becomes more of a temporal passage uh, and the uh, cause seems to be more considered of, uh, of an eternal finding. Socrates says the only true wisdom is to know that you know nothing. It's a very important statement because the more you know of something, the more you see there is. Uh, for example, let's say we were like, okay, let's, let's know what's beyond our atmosphere. So we found that out when we went to the moon and whatnot. And then we're like, oh my God, there's a, uni there's, you know, the, like complete, you know, existence, universal world with so many billions of galaxies and black holes, which could have potentially many galaxies and universes in them. So we are realizing the more we know, the more there is to know. And so science is, to some degree, trying to measure an infinite expression. It's very fascinating for me. I'm going to share a bit more of that panic shock I got. The, the sense of shock was in some sense where I'm like, okay, what is this? I am a being that exists. I have been born. I will die. What is this? Why am I in this form? Why, am, why is my attention here? And uh, what is the point of the language and the words I know, you know, when there's so many ways that you can know things. There's so many ways you can approach reality. You know, the more human beings there are, the more approaches there are to existence. In some sense, the more dimensions of experience there are. That means I find kind of, let's say there's three perspectives. The scientific perspective is we are a small thing and a very big thing. The religious perspective is we are a small thing, but we can be a big thing. The spiritual perspective is we are a big thing and a small thing. The vastness of experience 
is based on the active energy that is perceiving. You know, so a tired person may feel they're a small thing in a big thing. An energetic person may feel they're a big thing in a small thing, you know. The more big you see yourself, how can I tell you? It's like, it's like you're either a fish in an ocean or you're an ocean keeping the experience of a fish present. Many approaches can be had. I was raised in a spiritual perspective in the sense that um, there were a lot of spiritual ideologies and then I was schooled in non-spiritual ideologies as I went to school. And then when I went into temples, I began to gain religious perspectives. <clears throat> and then eventually, temples and mosques, you know. I came into this conclusion that what I truly believe or disbelieve has nothing to do with what I have experienced. I can believe, like I could be in a room and there could be another room and someone says, there is like a huge elephant in that room, you know? I believe there is a huge elephant in this room and once we open the door, you know, we get to this elephant, you know? And someone who, uh, who, who is still not in that room, he can believe it, he can disbelieve it, they can argue for eons, but it is only the direct experience that uh, actually gives you uh, a, a knowledge that applies uh, in the existence. So we can say that we human beings, we are in a certain design. This design, based on our free will, can have many interpretations. <clears throat> and it can also not have an interpretation. But there is a nature in everything. So the nature of that fence I saw in front of the hotel its nature was also based on how I was perceiving it, but it was made in some way. And so human beings, they're not fences, even though they can create fences, both mentally and physically. There is a nature to expression in the sense that it happens. And when we can abide by how it happens, we become surfers of our own experience. That means, um, how can I say this? I guess to simplify it, it's kind of like abiding by your true nature. But the truth of nature is beyond the interpreter that is abiding. It's like the surfer is not the ocean. He cannot know how the ocean is exactly moving. But he is abiding by it and he's going with the waves and whatnot. I hope in this talk you find a sense of wanting to wonder about the nature of experience and the nature of existence and the essence uh, behind all phenomena. In some senses it will be incomprehensible, but in some senses it will be comprehensible in the sense that uh, the surfer can understand more of how it needs to move on the wave rather than just trying to be the ocean, you know. We can say human beings are evolution's way of asking deeper questions. You know, many animals you see on this planet, even birds, they don't ask, they're just living, they're just alive. But human beings, they are somehow self-aware to how they are living and they can wonder about different potentialities. So we can say human beings have a second life, which is to some degree an abstract way of interpreting uh, much more possibilities. So animals, let's say, they're having a finished experience. <clears throat> they're just here, they exist, they live, and then they die. Human beings have an ability <clears throat> in their minds to wonder about infinity. I don't see any other animal being able to do this. And because we can wonder about infinity, it's simply because we have become conscious of our mortality. You can be the cosmos in the person, you can be a person in the cosmos, you can be a moment that is uh, keeping all simultaneously present. You can stare at people, you can be stared at, but at the end of ends, you are the beginning of your interpretation of all life.
I hope this talk has served you. And I guess the last sentence I would like to say. Let us use our existence to realize beyond the experience we are free. Beyond any mode of experience, we are an awareness that is free. Whether you are a dolphin looking at a human being or a human being looking at a dolphin and wondering if the awareness and the consciousness within the dolphin and within the person is the same or not. Seldom it is said, but the twist in evolution is infinite, like the infinity symbol. Much blessings and love.